All right, joining us now is Humayun Sheikh, who is the founder and CEO of Fetch AI. Humayun, how are you doing? Uh, I was going to say this morning, but for you, it's this evening. Yeah. All, all well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Matt. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, also. Much appreciated. Yeah, and this is uh, at least... At least the follow up where we haven't figured out if we've had you on once or twice or, or three times, but happy to have you back either way. And for those that haven't heard of Fetch AI before, can you give us a high level overview of, of what your company does and how it fits into the wider industry? Yeah, so Fetch was set up to um, bring AI to blockchain. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, we're now four years old in crypto. Uh, we, we're building technical solutions, we're building the tools, we're building the infrastructure to bring machine learning and AI to the, the, the DLT, uh, and we're creating interoperability in terms of bringing uh, different machine learning models together and also bringing different chains together to execute, uh, you know, automation tasks and uh, bringing AI to, you know, kind of the crypto world and generally uh, in a decentralized way, building solutions, which, um, you know, which uh, everybody can use. And there's a lot more uh, democratization of AI solutions. So that's, that's what we do. So in a way, Fetch AI represents a, a platform for others to build on. Am I understanding that correctly? Awesome. Yeah. And so with that in mind, what are some of the more concrete examples that you've seen either so far or proposed that, that you think are great? example or uh, great applications of AI within the blockchain space. Yeah. So, so if I think about blockchain, I think about decentralization and I, you know, that's the premise. Um, I don't like to always just bring, because there's crypto has a connotation of coins. So it's not just about coins. It's about the premise of blockchain, which is decentralization. So if you think about decentralization and bringing true decentralization to all possible use cases in the world, uh, all, all of these use cases need to be somehow uh, feeding machine learning uh, or AI algorithms, right? So uh, if you think about uh, trading on uh, decentralized exchanges or peer-to-peer -peer trading all uh, you know it, it's a lot more complicated to do them on a you know like in DeFi uh, because there is no machine learning there's no AI models available it's quite difficult to bring them uh, on chain or do something in a decentralized fashion so what we our solutions enable people to build these models machine learning models which can actually feed into, for example, DeFi and make a much better experience for the users of DeFi. Uh, you know, if I go away from the DeFi space, then if I look at, let's say, uh, any other solution, which is in like in the real world, let's say we want to do uh, like in kind of a uh, transportation scheduling solution, um, again, you can do it in a very centralized way, or, or you can do it in a decentralized way, in which case the blockchain will be used. But to build a more efficient system, you need machine learning algorithms to be working. And how you bring those machine learning algorithms, how do you build them, and how do you bring them to this decentralized space is uh, is a very good example of where the world is going to be going. Uh, you know, marketplaces, open marketplaces where uh, search and discovery is quite important. I mean, as as you know, you know, search is not a simple problem. It's it's a complicated problem. It needs machine learning, needs artificial intelligence in terms of how do you present the most relevant results. All of this, if you want to bring it on chain, needs needs this kind of tools that we're building. Interesting. And so, as you walk through that, and and you know, you mentioned machine learning and and things of that nature. I think a lot of the AI space is a little, it, it's still a bit over the heads of, of the average Joe. And really our, our first exposure to it, at the general public is, is things like chat GPT and, you know, Dolly, for example, where, where we can uh, interact with these things with, with natural language and then spit something else out uh, that, you know, we might not have been able to do otherwise. So with all that in mind and knowing that the, uh, the general public is mostly familiar with things like ChatGPT now. 
what are the similarities between those models that people have interacted with already and what you're building? And is there any similarity? So I think it's a you know yes yes this chat GPT and OpenAI's uh, you know kind of interactive model has only brought uh, some part of this whole space to the users. But users have been using it. You know when you use Google, you're using machine learning and AI. When you use uh, Airbnb, you're using machine learning and AI. When you anything you pick up your phone, you're using machine learning and AI, one way, shape, or form. So you're already using it. You just don't know. And I think that's the beauty of uh, you know technology when people don't know they're using it, but they're using it. So what what um, ChatGPT has done is really brought to people's front what it is capable kind of perhaps of doing. Now, if you think of what ChatGPT has done is to provide a solution which is text-based. So now you can see there is some, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it intelligence, but you can create things autonomously, which is uh, go write me a software which does this, right? So, but then comes the next stage, you know, uh, how many people are going to go and ask for writing a software and which then they will have to run. The, the next jump for a normal consumer would be, oh, go and find me, uh, go and find me a cleaner, go and find me a taxi, go and find me the best, um, you know, restaurant and book it for me. So that would be the next step. That's the next transition. And that's where we come in. So what we're doing is we're saying there is this user interface, which is great, which is coming. Now you can use it or you might not want to use it, uh, which is intelligent effectively. But then you convert that into an action. And to convert that into an action, you need to provide context. For example, it's, it's you know, I prefer Thai food. You prefer some other food. Uh, how do I bring that into the mix? And then how do I go and execute that solution? How do I actually go and connect with the, the restaurant and book that uh, table for you? Um, if you do it in a very centralized way, then it's siloed again. The data is siloed, uh, the information is siloed, and the action is siloed, and somebody will take a cut in the middle. What we're saying is all the algorithms need to be open, uh, you know, perhaps not necessarily open, but the actions should be visible. So if you got a recommendation from a machine learning uh, algorithm, then you should know about it. You should uh, you should know who trained it, how it was trained, what's the bias, and then actually taking that and and one of our uh, kind of focus area of technology is the autonomous economic agents, which are a piece of software which enables you to actually transact on your behalf. So you're giving it autonomy to transact and interact with uh, multiple stakeholders and then execute a solution. So that's the next step which is coming. So what we have just seen is the user interface. What we're going to see is now the action and autonomy and uh, automation in that action. And for that, you really need predictions to act on and machine learning models to help you uh, kind of execute a task. Thank you. Wow. I, I really appreciate your insight into that. That was a great breakdown for, you know, I'm I'm personally still learning about all this, but but for those that, that are unfamiliar with the topic outside of just hearing about it, I think that helps us, you know, contextualize the power of this uh quite a bit. And and so with that in mind and and going off of uh you know having mentioned open AI, uh I I wonder what your take is on the push for you know government regulations uh you know especially like sam altman is is going in front of congress calling for this to to be regulated where you know where do you see that or how do you see that shaping up and and do you think it's important for uh, regulatory bodies to be paying attention to to the power of ai at this stage of development um it's it's definitely important for them to be paying attention um I disagree with some of the things which are happening in terms of regulation. Uh, you know, it's 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 always great for people who are ahead to go and start inputting into regulation. But there, you know, if I just put that aside for a second and I just look at some things which we already know, right? We don't need anybody telling us what AI is and or anything. What we know is data is out there. My data should belong to me when you monetize it. It should belong to me, right? I should get a, you know, I need to be given giving permission uh, either 
for, for no economic return or some economic return, right? Whatever I do with my data, it should be mine. Now, we're kind of coming to that conclusion already. Now, if you train a machine learning model, right, uh, on my data, and it's a generative AI model, and it generates something which has one twenty thousandth percent of uh, my input into it, how do I get rewarded for it? And why did somebody not ask me? We have copyright laws. So all of that exists. So, so the first step in all of this regulation is perhaps to see if there is a commercial benefit, let's say for either OpenAI, which is not open, or some other company, uh, somebody needs to prove what data it was trained on. So, you know, that's the starting point for the regulator to see. It's like, okay, can you tell me how this uh, generative AI is doing what it's doing and whose data was used to actually deliver that? Now, that's that's a problem which we need to solve first before we get into, oh, what is this AI going to do and how is it doing it? Because that's a complete black box right now. So, so in steps, it's a great idea for the regulators to get engaged, but what you don't want to do is overregulate and say, oh, well, you can't do this for six months because we're letting other people catch up. I mean, I, you know, that's a that's a strange approach, which I don't buy into. Uh, so, so, yeah, so regulators should get involved and there is the right time, which is now to get involved. But we need to start from grassroots, right? Just say, OK, well, here's, where's the data come from? How can you provide me an audit trail for that data so that I know who's trained it? And then you need to see how it's been trained. That's the second step. How many people were involved? Which parties are involved in training it? And again, this is this is the whole point of what we do. Uh, you know, one of our tools is called CoLearn, which enables multiple people to come together and train a machine learning model. And there's a whole audit trail: who trained it, on which data, which um, kind of training was accepted, which was rejected, and it's all on chain, so people can actually. Go and look at it. So when you come to it, you can look at biases, you can look at auditability. So those tools are available and regulators need to kind of take note of, you know, starting to regulate at that level. Interesting. And as you walk through that, I I can't help but think that Pandora's box has been opened, so to say, and there's there's no going back at this point. And and coupling that with the fact that the AI space within, you know, the crypto industry really saw a lot of consumer attention, especially, you know, within the market. Do you think that was deserved? Do you think we're, do you think your sector is, is still early in development? Or do you think this is the right time for uh, investors to be paying attention to it, but also, you know, for developers to come in and start building applications that, that use, you know, the, the underpinnings of, of this AI tech? Right. So I'm I'm going to try and separate it out into a couple of things, right? There we you know as much as you know I think there's there's a really good uh, method in crypto developers and there's all you know because there's such a fast pace in you know this decentralized space and open source space there is obviously always going to be this hype element so so there's always hype right. But that doesn't just apply to crypto and you know you look you look around in stocks and shares there's plenty of people going after ai based projects now is it is it fair is it valid yes because what open ai and chat gpt has shown um is quite a technical leap right so we should we should look at it because it's changing the model for sure why because you know we need to take note of the fact that you know, a lot of news and media and everything is going to change. There's going to be a lot of fake news. There's going to be generative art. There is code, there is software which is coming. You know, we have to take note of it. All the developers, software developers are going to feel the pinch because, you know, one person is now 100x more productive. So of course there is a there is a good reason to, to have that hype and there's a good reason to uh, for the projects to appreciate. But what is more interesting, uh, I mean, that's happening, right? So that's that has gradually been happening. Uh, in my time during um, you know, DeepMind, we, 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 we were looking at text. We were looking at text and we were looking at creating actions in the video games, right? Now it's coming to real world. So there is a, 
There's a shift, but it's still there. But there is a big paradigm shift which is coming. So now take AI, which is doing these things automatically by itself. It's learning, it's delivering these things and it's doing things or it's not doing them yet, but it actually has the capability of, you know, I would say kind of thinking and creating a solution for some kind, you know, it can generate text. It, the text can then be converted into actions. But on the other side, what we've seen is quite a lot of decentralization where FinTech is kind of, you know, the DeFi, the FinTech is kind of starting to get a little bit of traction of decentralization. So now if you combine the two together, what the two things are going to change. One, there one is the, the communication, how we communicate with each other. That's already been changing. So if you look at how we speak to each other, how we connect with each other, there are multiple ways, Facebook, you know, we have uh, TikTok, we have other social media services. So that's that's just you know, communication is always changing in this world. And, and you know, now we're looking at decentralized Twitter, decentralized this, decentralized all of that. So there's a peer-to-peer -peer element to that. So that's the, the, the communication. But what is quite interesting is the connectivity, which is also changing. So the two things need to change, and that leads into a paradigm shift on how we do things. Now, let me just come back to the connectivity. Previously, what the way we connect is multiple layers. So we have the TCP IP, we have HTTP. So that's layer zero. On top of that, we have these other ways of uh, connecting to each other. So you go to Google to connect to a website to, you know, you search and you connect to a website. And then you have the next level where you go to these aggregators, for example, that's the layer uh, two, where the aggregators say, oh, if you want to book a holiday, you don't need to go to Google or anywhere come here and book it. So that's the third layer of connectivity. And then after that, you have the social media, which is, you know, which is a bit more loose, but not as focused. But what's coming now with all of this change is the ability of a user or a consumer or somebody to find somebody without the need of these middle parties like Google or why? Because there's a peer-to-peer -peer communication model which is opening up. And with this intelligence, with this AI and machine learning becoming more and more accessible, you don't need those big search engines, either of aggregator search engines, or you don't need them in the middle to connect you to the end uh, supplier or the consumer. So that's going to be a paradigm shift which is coming now. And do you want to become part of it? That's the hype or not. Uh, then if you don't believe in it, then obviously there is no hype. I mean, yes, there will be a development in AI, but the, the, the core development is when it converts everything into, you know, who is needed and whose kind of jobs. We talk about jobs, but we talk about utility of different companies as well. Some of the companies don't need to exist. Some of the companies, their use will be limited. And that's what the shift that is coming. And if you don't stay connected with it, you could lose out. It so hence creates the, the FOMO effect. Yeah. There are dozens of threads that, that just came up in, in your explanation there that I would love to follow. But out of respect for time, we'll have to move on just a little bit. We At some point, we're going to have to set up a two-hour interview, you know, and, and really, really dig so into these topics. Lot. Right. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And so bringing it back home a little bit, I want to ask, are there, you know, is there anything that you and your team are working on at Fetch AI right now that you're particularly excited about, uh, you know, maybe in the next six months or a year coming to market? It's a very exciting time. I could tell you that. And and we are very excited uh, about what we are actually working on. This is, but this is not like something uh, there's something new that we are speaking about. This we we saw this whole space changing and this whole this agent based AI based change coming for the last four four years. I mean, we were set up five years ago, but you know, we got into DLT space four years ago. So we've been working on this, and I am really really quite excited about the fact that what has happened with uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT is people have now kind of you know, sit up and actually understand what we are actually saying. So, for example, if you said to ChatGPT, 
I want to go on a holiday in Spain for two days or five days, it will tell you in complete detail where you could go and what you could do. But what you can't do is, okay, now go and look. Now, now actually, I like this. Go and book it. Suddenly, things change. No, you need to provide a lot of context. Uh, you need to provide a lot of direction. Okay, go to this place and go. And, but the onus is now back onto the consumer. So one thing which we are really excited about is that we're building a system which automatically works out all the components which need to be executed and they get executed using a concept we have is micro agents, which is a bit like microservice, but decentralized microservices. So these micro agents then go and do all these little tasks and then come back and report it to the agent to do the whole execution. Now that's a very, very cool thing that we're working on. And we're, you know, we're 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 gonna be you know ready to demonstrate quite a few things. But that's quite exciting. And we, we've talked about this, uh, but now we're building these solutions which 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 are which are amazing things. And I think it's gonna probably um as you see, the people understand it more, hence the people would appreciate it more. So that's one of the, the coolest things which I feel yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and I appreciate the nuance that you added to that in the way that uh, you have been working on this for almost, you know, half a decade now. And, and really it's these, these very public facing applications like ChatGPT that has brought it to the mainstream. And so with that in mind and, and knowing that, that you and your project are, are pretty far along in development, how, how do you see this newfound attention in the, you know, within the space affecting you over the next say three to five years in other words where do you see your sector in three to five years yeah we we welcome it because i think it's about time yeah time <laughs> understand what we've been bloody talking about we, we've been talking about agents for god knows how long um over the next three to five years i think we're going to see an exponential growth in solutions which come out of all this space and there's going to be plenty and we, we're already seeing that now, there will, of course, be a die down because a lot of companies are now saying just starting and mentioning the words AI and blockchain, AI and machine learning. And they think, you know, so just like in any field, you know, you know we had we had huge amounts of attention on NFTs, you know, a year ago. And then it was all metaverse. You know, it doesn't mean they're not useful. It doesn't mean there's going to be companies which you know deliver good stuff. But there's going to be a lot of hyped companies and those will die. So I think we'll see the same over the next two, three years. Uh, some companies which are relevant will continue and uh, they deliver, they will keep delivering. And I think we'll see, you know, a, a really strong uptake on, on those solutions. And some of the companies are going to obviously die creating some bad image for, you know, the hype. So that's pretty normal, I guess, in this cycle. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. And and I think it's it's net positive, but I uh, yeah. appreciate your perspective on that. And and I think you're in, you know, you of all people are in that position to really to really see that change and and uh, sort through the stuff that uh, is maybe a little bit nonsense. So anyway, you know, with that in mind, uh, we're we're getting close to our time here. And that's all the questions I have for you. But before we go, is there anything you want to leave our listeners with in terms of where they can learn more about uh, you or Fetch AI or anything else? Yeah, we have we have a pretty good community going on Twitter. Uh, we also have a you know a website is fetch.ai. Please visit it. Uh, it kind of tells you, uh, you know, hopefully you know uh, you can get also get engaged. We have uh, community programs. We have developer programs. We what we would like people to do is to yeah just you know touch and feel this technology which is coming you know starting from very basics. We made it very easy. We have some courses. We have some. Uh, a lot of easy documentation to read, launch some agents, connect some AI to it, uh, you know, get get kind of, because we're all going to, it, this will impact all of us and we are all going to be interacting with AI. So, you know, it's better to know the AI and speak to it and talk about it and do something with it so that you understand it better. And for developers, I think this is a big, big opportunity to create new solutions which don't exist create new business models, which are very difficult with the current, uh, you know, e-commerce systems. 
um, to come and you know try it out and you know let's let's be innovative and build different solutions. Absolutely, very exciting, and uh, really want to thank you again for for coming in. We look forward to to talking to you again in the future and and catching up with you uh, when or as development continues and yeah. as your ecosystem grows. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Yeah, that's awesome. great. Thank you. Catch you later. Cheers.